living in my heart today. I'm asking you, is Jesus living in your heart today? Because he wants to. Jesus came, gave his life, went through all that he went through, just so he could be the Lamb of God to pay the price for your sins. Welcome today. Thanks for worshiping with me just a moment this morning. I love the old hymns and I love that this is Resurrection Weekend and we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are celebrating that he is risen. He didn't just rise from the dead, but he's still alive and well and has risen from the dead. I watched this morning uh, Pastor George and Pastor Terry Pearsons. I watched my precious uh, man of God, uh, Brother Kenneth Copeland, who uh, ordained me many, many years ago, along with uh, Pastor Billy Brem and her precious church, the Glorious Church in Oklahoma. And I uh, also then watched uh, House of Prayer, and Laura did, Pastor Laura did an amazing job with uh, Psalm 22. And I just want to pick up with Psalm 22, verse 22, before we jump into chapter 11 today. And I want to read the end of that chapter after the prophetic words given in Psalm 22 of the entire uh, crucifixion. And then uh, verse 22 says, A twentyfold glory and exaltation of the Messiah. Picks up with verse 22. It's the final portion of chapter uh, 22 in the psalm. And I just want to pick it up there because of the worship involved. It says, I will declare thy name. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Praise God. This is what we do. We thank God for his resurrection, but then we turn around and we praise him for resurrection, not just only through his life absolutely but because of his resurrection we have eternal life and we can forever be resurrected in his presence ye that fear the lord praise him all ye the seed of jacob glorify him and fear him fear means to worship to adore to revere 
that's why we don't fear anything other than the fear of the Lord, because we don't want to worship, adore, and revere sickness or worship, adore, and revere uh, a disease. We don't want to do that. We want to worship, revere, and adore the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The seventh spirit of the Lord is the fear of the Lord, and we give him only our worship, our adoration, and our reverence. All you seed of Israel, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Now this is, I'm bringing this to your remembrance because I want you to hear this before we jump into chapter 11 of location, location, location in the Rebuilding the Ruins book. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise. I could stop right here and go through each and every one of these verses, but I just want to read it to you. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the earth, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, which many, many, many do turn today. And many, many, many remember what the Lord has done. And I'm just reminding you of the communion CD. If you have not downloaded or ordered that communion CD from our website, SalemFamilyMinistries.org, right there. I'm encouraging you to do so for I go through the teaching on the five cuts of covenant, particularly the fifth cut made in the side of the bridegroom for the bride on that communion CD as we worship God together in prophetic communion. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. We should be fat with the fatness, the, the richness, the glory of the Lord should make us uh, more than enough of his presence for the world around us. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. I just want to bring that and, th and thank all of you who stand as partners with our ministry, all of you who give and help us in the ministry, your seed shall serve him. For we don't use that in any way uh, incorrectly, but we listen to the Holy Spirit. Every precious seed that you give, it's prayed over, it is dedicated to the Lord, it is given to the work of the Lord. And, and we just thank God that you um, trust the Lord enough to trust us with the seed and know that we are very careful with what the Lord has entrusted us. With every penny, we, we make sure that it is dedicated unto the Lord. And listen to this, your seed shall serve the Lord. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. Now that can be your physical, financial seed, but also think about your generations to come. Your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. They shall all serve him, and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he has done this. My favorite verse in all of this is the last one. For what he is saying is he is prophesied that the, Jesus has already given his life for all of us. It's prophetic. It is done. David saw it. He heard it. He witnessed it. He wrote it. He sang it about the coming of the Lord the first time, Messiah the first time, and of him giving his life for all of us. And then he goes on and he prophesies the next generation that you and me. And then he says, for a he shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That's you and me. We shall be born at this time when it was written 
we should be born. We will be born in the future. And now we are here and we have received the declaration of his righteousness. We walk in his righteousness. We wear the robe of righteousness. Because of what Jesus did, we are righteous. We are holy. Be holy even as I am holy. Because he says it, we can walk in it. I, I'm thinking of the new song, uh, <clears throat> uh, I Want to Be Holy. Be holy as I'm holy are the words I hear you say. Even though the world around me seems it's going the other way. See, these are the things that this is saying. You are a people who are holy unto me. You are righteous because of what I did, Jesus said. That you're, you shall be born, that he hath already done this. So in that one verse, he's talking present. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. He's talking of future that he hath already done this past, past, present, and future. That is the verse of God. He is, he, he is the was, he is the is, and he is the is to come. So, and then of course that sets us right up for the sixth messianic Psalm of David with the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And we go right into Psalm 23. So thank you all for joining me today. I know it's Easter. I know you've had so uh, much already going on in your lives and in your uh, families and in your local churches. And I'm so thankful for all of that going on. I am so thankful for each and every one of you and for the power of God moving through you. I am so thankful for you being with me today. Uh, Rick, thank you. Happy Resurrection Day. Jean, uh, yes, I just lit, I just sent you and Bob and Jacob a message. I love you, Jean. Hi, Laura. Great message this morning. Hi, Tamara. So good to see you. I want to live holy. That's right, Laura. Everybody just say that before the Lord right now, if you don't mind saying it and put it in the comments. I want to live holy. And by the way, you probably heard, Laura, that for whatever reason, the uh, pedal is now fixed <laughs> in the piano. So thank you, Lord. Now, let's jump into rebuilding the ruins of worship in our lives today. And let's jump into 1 Samuel chapter 3. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 21. So while I do that, I'm just going to turn on the pad so that it is in the background while the scripture is going forth. Let me know if it's too loud. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation, and it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying there, that the Lord called Samuel. And he said, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli said, I did not call you, my son. Go lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So Samuel arose and he went to Eli and he said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Now, many say that Samuel's about 12 years older at this time. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be. If he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came, and he stood, and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Speak, for your servant hears.
for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel, and at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day, I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I've told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows. Because his sons have made themselves vile and he will not restrain them. I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning and he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and he said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and moreover if you hide anything from me of all the things that he has said. Then Samuel told him everything and he hid nothing from him. And Samuel shared it all and Eli said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Wow. Samuel let none of God's words fall to the ground, and God let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. For every prophetic word he gave, God fulfilled, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Why? Because God allowed not one word of Samuel to fall to the ground, but each and every word produced. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. The backstory to what we just read in the Bible is so beautiful that I can't leave it out. Hannah was a woman who loved God. She came with her husband and her, his other wife each year to Shiloh to worship God. Her husband's other wife tormented Hannah emotionally because Hannah was barren and could not have any children. By the way, you may be the one who's been tormented by humanity tormented by people. But notice God did not remove the tormentor. He just gave Hannah a word. So many times we're asking God to remove the tormentor when we should be listening for the word of the Lord. She begged the Lord to give her a child, to open her womb and allow her to give birth to a son. She made a deal with the Lord that she would give the child back to the Lord. Now, 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 uh, don't miss that. <laughs> She's begging the Lord for a son so that she has a son to give back to him, which she gives at his weaning. I'm not talking when he's 30 at a priesthood level. No, I'm talking at three or four. She takes her son and leaves him with Eli the priest a long distance away and sees her son once a year from then on. Are you willing to ask the Lord to give you something someone, 
whatever it is, just so you have that to give back to him. That was the heart of Hannah. She begged the Lord to give her a child to open her womb and to allow her to give birth to a son. She made a deal with the Lord that she would give the child back to the Lord, bring him back to the priest, and allow the priest to rear her son in the ways of the priesthood. This is like a prophetic of Mary. When Jesus was given to her womb, she immediately knew he was not hers to give. He was not hers to keep. He was hers to give. And as much as she loved her son, she needed a Messiah more than she needed a son. So she brought him back to the priest to allow the priest to rear her son in the ways of the priesthood. If only he would grant her petition. The Lord gave her a son and she fulfilled her agreement with him. After she weaned her son, whose name was Samuel, she brought him back to Shiloh and gave him to Eli the priest to rear him as he saw fit for God. And what's amazing was Eli had not reared his own sons correctly, but she wasn't trusting Eli. She was trusting God. And so many times we put our trust in man when we should be putting our trust in God. We say, well, you know, I can't trust this one. I can't trust that one. And so you withhold what God tells you to give because you're thinking that you're giving to the person when you're actually giving to God. It is a little ambiguous in the time frame of just how old her son was when she brought him to Eli, but we know he was quite small. Jewish tradition gives us some insight into the general time frame. Being around five years old or kindergarten age, he was a very little boy, still a baby in his mother's thoughts. Certainly in his mother's thoughts, he was too small to leave with a priest who was a long distance from home, and by all accounts, she would only see him once a year when she brought him a new little ephod, a new little priest covering, Samuel was a priest in training, so he needed the proper attire for his calling. And you may be a priest in training, but you need to dress yourself appropriately in your robe of righteousness with your garment of praise every day of your life. Do not leave your house without the righteousness of God being holy, being covered up in the the garment of praise. Hannah kept her promise to the Lord. Honestly, I don't know how she did it, but the Bible plainly states that she did. It also tells us that the Lord gave her other children. Once she gave Samuel back to the Lord, he then gave her other children. God will always keep his promises to us and bless us even more than we dare to ask him. Jean, he gives us more, more, and more. Hi, Hi, uh, Sonny. So good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Samuel grew and was educated in the ways of the priesthood by Eli. Eli was the priest at the same time, and he did, and he had other sons who were not good sons, and they were not good priests. They were not disciplined and had many issues in their lives. This would have been one of those times that the Lord would have had to assure me that he would be a father to the fatherless if I'm going to leave my son to be trained by a priest whose own born priest children were not disciplined and were not operating godly, were not operating in righteousness. Hannah trusted God, and the Lord proved himself strong to Samuel. As we read 1 Samuel chapter 3, some particularly interesting details seem to emerge within the verses. First of all, notice that the scriptures say that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. It does not say that the word was completely void, but it does say that the word was rare. So hearing from heaven was not an everyday event. Notice that Eli the priest had made his bed in his own place, the scripture says. But Samuel, the priest in training, made his bed by the Ark of the Covenant in the Lord's place. So Samuel's heart was showing when he did not go to his own place and make his bed. But even though he'd never heard the word of the Lord in his ears, he didn't know the voice of the Lord. He still went to bed every night expectant. He made his bed right at the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant, right in the inner court, right by the veil. He made his bed just in case God has something to say. I want to make sure I'm in position to hear. Are you making sure that your location is proper 
to hear the Lord. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, but it didn't mean he was never speaking. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant always represents the presence of the Lord. The priest did not see the need to be in God's presence, and that's why, quite possibly, he was not rearing his boys right because he wasn't in his own position in the rightful place to hear from God. Had he been able to hear from God himself and had ears tuned to the Spirit of God, God wouldn't have had to spoke to a little 12-year-old boy to bring a word from heaven to him when he, the priest, should be able to hear from God himself. The priest did not see the need to be in God's presence, but the little boy, the young priest in training, made his bed as close to the presence of God as he could get. Hey, sweet girl, I'm glad you're with us, Tammy. Go back to church, and you can watch this later. Love you all, praying and continuing to pray for your daddy, for a miracle. Where are you making your bed each night? Do you make sure before you go to sleep each night that you're in the Lord's presence? You can, just like Samuel did. And he lied. It could, he could have done that too, but he didn't. There are reasons why some people seek God's presence and others do not. Some of these reasons we've already discussed, treating the presence of God casually, for one. Not being truly comfortable in God's presence, which means you don't house his presence. Once you house his presence and you are spirit-filled, you don't have a spirit drop, you don't have a spirit cup, you don't have a spirit court. You are filled to the brim with the spirit of God. There is no way to not be comfortable when you are wall to wall, ceiling to floor, every part of your being filled with the Spirit of God. Too many people are uncomfortable in the presence of God because they don't house Him. Not being truly comfortable in God's presence, not judging oneself or laying oneself at the feet of God Almighty are other reasons some run from the presence of God while others are running too the presence of God. Which are you doing? Put it in the comments. Hi, Charlie. He is risen, everyone. I am running to the presence of God. If that's you, put it in the comments that you're running to the presence of God. You're not running from the presence of God. As Samuel was resting and maybe even had already fallen asleep, he heard a voice call his name and not a voice he was familiar with, but a voice he was listening for. He jumped up and he ran to where Eli made his bed. This makes me think that Eli may have called for Samuel regularly after they'd retired for the evening. Eli told Samuel that he had not called him and to go back and lie down again. Samuel got still again by the Ark of the Covenant and he heard a voice call his name again. Samuel ran to Eli and said, you did call me. But Eli told him again that he'd not called him to go lie down. Samuel, Samuel, came the sound from heaven again. And Samuel bolted from his bed, ran to Eli's bed, insisting that you most certainly did call me. Finally, took three times before Eli, the lead priest, recognized it was the voice of the Lord. Eli, discerning that this voice could actually have been the voice of the Lord calling Samuel, so Eli gave Samuel instructions as to how to respond to the voice from heaven as if he was called once more. And I pray that I am instructing you properly how to listen for the voice of the Lord and how to respond. I'm listening, Lord. Speak. Eli told him to answer, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This indicated a submissive position in God's presence and an, and an acknowledgement of the Lord's presence and the Lord's position in Samuel's life. Now, why do you think that Samuel could hear the voice of the Lord and Eli the priest could not hear the Lord's voice? Could it be that while Eli had been used to making his bed outside of the presence of the Lord, that he'd become accustomed to not hearing from heaven anymore? So he wasn't listening. In our church world today, I call these types of people who say they are definitely Christians, and yet there's no hunger for his presence, no hunger for his voice, no hunger for his presence and spirit. I call them carnal Christians. They, they, they say they're Christians. They say they know the Lord, but they don't know his voice. Carnal, fleshly, not spirit. And I am speaking broadly to even call them Christians. The carnal part is definitely correct, but the Christian part, well, I'm not so sure that's correct. To be Christ-like denotes an intimate bond between the bridegroom and his Christ-like 
bride. To be casual about his presence, to not hunger or thirst for his presence, to be okay with the fact that the voice of the Lord was rare in those days. I hope you're not okay if you're not hearing his voice. Don't be okay. Get hungry. The Lord's voice was rare in those days is enough to give a clear view of the condition of the hearts of those who call themselves God's people. It's not unlike today, really. So many people profess to be Christians and call themselves regular church attendees, and yet there's no indication that they're hearing from heaven at all. Sometimes I think that these so-called Christians would not even know the Lord if he appeared to them and met them face to face. I'm thinking on Resurrection Day how those Jesus appeared to and walked for miles with them, and they didn't recognize him, didn't recognize his voice, didn't recognize any part of him. And this is actually what happened to Samuel after he acknowledged the Lord, submitted, submitted himself to hear his voice and be a servant. The scriptures say that the Lord came and he stood. As many times as I've read this scripture and heard this story over the many years of Sunday school and preaching and now over 30 years of, of biblical studies myself, and, and let's just add to that because this was written a while back by about 49 years of biblical study. I've never noticed before that the Lord came and actually appeared to Samuel. It makes me want to make sure that I'm making my bed in the presence of the Lord each night, that I'm asking for ears to hear and eyes to see what the Spirit of God wants me to hear and see. This is an awesome awakening scripture to how much the Lord longs to be with us, and it also exposes how little we as humanity long to be with Him. If we longed for His presence more, I believe we would have his manifested presence more. I believe it was not the Lord's doing that his voice was rare in those days, but rather because of their casual, irreverent approach to his presence and his voice that brought about the drought of the sound of heaven to earth. Samuel's hunger and positioning himself in the right location seemed to be the triggers that activated the manifested presence of the Lord in the audible sound of his voice once again to humanity. When it comes to real estate, the old saying is location, location, location. I believe that when it comes to the presence of the Lord, that it all boils down to the same thing for us too. What is your location, your location, your location to his presence? Are you listening? Are you positioning yourself to hear his voice? Are you listening for his voice? Are you positioning yourself to see his face? Are you looking for his eyes? The one thing I can I am certain of is that the Lord wants to be with us. He wants to talk to us and he wants to show us his salvation. I'm absolutely convinced any absence of his presence is not about him, but it is an exposing of our heart's conditions as humanity seeks to hear from just about everybody else before they start to seek his voice and his direction. What's your first turn? To your phone? To your neighbor? To your best friend? Or to the Lord? We spend so much time listening to the news, watching mindless TV, paying much money going to see movies that we have to literally protect our eye gate and our ear gate just to sit there. We spend so much time listening to information from humans that's so lower and slower and watered down. Are we hearing the Spirit of God? Are, are our minds inundated with human sound waves too low to be worth anything? I'm not talking about all of humanity right now, please. I'm just talking about those who don't have ears to hear or eyes to see. I'm talking about a people who say they're called by his name and expect to be the group called his bride and yet don't hear his voice, don't hunger for his voice, don't listen for his voice. If we want to hear from heaven, then we must position ourselves in his presence. We have to turn off the sounds of the earth. And tune in to the sounds of heaven. We must fill our spirits and our hearts with the word of God. And cause our spirits to be ever hungry for his presence. Overtaking our fleshly hungers and annihilating 
our carnality with the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. We talk about wanting to rule and reign with Him, and yet we as a whole body of so-called believers barely give Him even a tithe of our daily time. Out of a 24-hour period of time, which we call a full day and night, the tithe is two hours and 24 minutes a day. And that is not even answering the call to pray without ceasing. Hmm. So the question still remains to you personally. Where are you making your bed each night? Is it near his very presence? Remember, to spend eternity next to him, we need to learn to do so while we're still in training here on earth. Within the womb of heaven, we call this earth realm the womb of heaven. Are you being trained to be in his presence, to hear his presence, to see his face? The earth is the womb of heaven. It is where we develop into who we will be for all of eternity. If we do not develop, we may be birthed into eternity premature in our growth and development. A preemie. Huh. Wow. I'm not sure what would happen at that point, and I'm not willing to risk my eternal future to find out, and I don't want to be birthed into heaven having to be, okay, I love God and He loves me, but I'm not mature enough to be there, so I have to be in an incubator until I grow up enough to be with Him. I don't want that. I want to be birthed straight into the throne room of God, straight into the war room with God. I'm making my bed as close to his presence as I can get. For me, this earth's experience is all about my location, my location, my location, which is what I choose. He won't pick me up like fairy dust and move me to the closest place in his presence. That's up to me to draw near to God, and he will draw near to me. Remember to spend eternity next to him. We need to learn to do so while we are still here in training within the womb of heaven we call this earth life. The earth is the womb of heaven. It is where we develop into who we will be for all of eternity. And I don't want to enter eternity a preemie. I want to enter eternity fully developed for his presence. And then you can go through the questions, please. Order your book and workbook if you have not already done so. I am asking you to go through this book and workbook. I'm asking you to send me on my email, Cheryl at SalemFamilyMinistries.org. Send me your answers to your questions in your book and your workbook. Please get this ordered. We've already done We Worship. We've already done Tones of the Throne Room. We've already done Holy Spirit. Now we're doing Rebuilding the Ruins of Worship. And we'll leave this to go into I Am a Worshipper. So I'm asking you to get your book and your workbook and work this through with me. And let's just remember who he is. And I know for me, this is actually short at 40 minutes, but I am expecting God to move in a mighty way in your life. And I just want you to keep hearing. He arose. He arose. Raise Jesus from the dead. Quickened your mortal flesh today. May you worship him in spirit and truth. May his face shine upon you. May his peace be within you. May you walk in his presence every day of your life. May you hear his voice and his voice not be rare in your life. But you are in constant and total communion with him today and every day. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he 
constantly show you his face and you constantly hear his voice. I love you. I appreciate you. We'll jump into chapter 12 in a few days, maybe tomorrow. Who knows? As the Spirit of God leads, I will be with you. And I look forward to you doing me a huge favor. Thumbs up on every video that you watch. Please watch it again after I post it today. Please watch it again. Put your comments again. Give me the thumbs up and hit that share button. Does us a world of good here. And I so appreciate you. See you soon. He is risen. He is risen. Resurrection is assured for he is risen.